So I frame uh, the discussion concerning worship around the reality of our approach and our sacrifice. And I think I've elaborated on that enough. You understand how uh, this approach, the word approach in Hebrew, like we've talked about, is korban, which is the word that's used for sacrifice. So we've talked about our sacrifice of praise, and the reality is that our approach is so incredibly vital for us, who we are as a congregation. We've put a lot of emphasis on this approach, praise and worship. And so in the process of talking about praise and worship, this, this holy approach that God has allowed us to be a part of, I said it was an ancient approach, and it certainly is. It actually goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, 6,000 years ago, roughly. So we talked about the unity aspect of praise and worship just a little bit last week. And I had a bit of a, well, I had a positive response from someone who was not here but listened to the message on the internet concerning unity. Sort of a revelational uh, perspective he received, and it's a very vital one. And for that person, going forward, he will forever understand the importance, the essentiality of unity as it relates to praise and worship, the life of the congregation. Now, I can stand here, as Pastor Ken did for many, many years, and sort of beat the gong on the importance of unity and how it relates to every aspect of who we are, particularly praise and worship. And, and I can beat that gong week in, week out, and you would just hear a loud noise and just, just sweep right over your head. You don't, you don't catch the essence of it. You don't receive revelationally the importance of unity. But every now and again, someone would. And that proverbial switch will be flipped. And suddenly, they've, they're, they're understanding and seeing something that they've heard many, many times, but suddenly it becomes internal. That's the point of revelation. When you receive something, from the Holy Spirit on the inner man, on the inner being. That's priceless. Because when it happens on that level, no one can ever take it away from you. It becomes your possession, your revelation. And it was good to hear that someone had that switch flipped in them. They needed to hear it. They certainly did. And I think many of us, we need to understand also how important worship is. And for many of us, perhaps some of us anyway, we need to have that flip, that, that switch flipped. We need to have it from a revelational perspective, just how vital worship, uh, uh, the unity of the body is as we approach God in this holy approach. So we, we, we read last week in John, John's Gospel, John chapter 17. Anyone, anyone remember exactly what was the point what was the focus in John 17? Anyone? Unity. Unity, right? But the essence of the, 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 the essence of reading in John 17 was to see, to perceive that this is actually Jesus' prayer. That Jesus, the night before the cross, and this was certainly the beginning of his passion as it relates to what he would accomplish on Golgotha, in that sense. Uh, the night before the cross, he prayed this most important prayer. And so we know just by that, that this is a pretty, a pretty, a pretty significant emphasis that Jesus had, and probably more than likely still has, that his church will be one, and his church will be united in him, he in God, and they in us. You see, that perspective, that's a revelational perspective, something that you must, must receive on the basis of revelation to understand just how relevant, how critical this unity is. It's a factor that we cannot do without. It's a factor that we will not prosper without. And it's relevant and pertinent to each of us individually and certainly as a congregation, that uni unifying factor. So on Friday nights, we're singing Leman Achai, Le'aman Achai is the name of the song. And, and I'm noticing, I'm beginning to realize that the song has a unifying effect. As we sing it, I see many of you turning to each other and even turning towards the camera and singing to one another this song, Le'aman Achai. And the song is certainly having a unifying effect in us. 
We used to sing Hine Matov, and, and we, we'll sing it some more. We have a new version of Hine, Hine Matov, and uh, it's trilingual, it's wonderful, and we'll sing that perhaps next week. So we would sing Hine Matov, and it would have this unifying effect. And it, it had for many, many years, and still could. But every now and again, a new expression, a new musical expression that will work to unite us is valuable. And Le'aman Achai apparently is having that effect as we sing it. Wonderful. We need that, we need that unity, unifying effect in us. But we can unify deliberately, purposely, without having the effect of a, of a song or the aid of a song that will help us to unify. In other words, we can commit ourselves to unifying intellectually and from our very souls without the employment of a song that will stir spiritually in us and bring us to that place. It's, it's a conscious decision that we must make to be one and to unify as one before God. And so we have a biblical, a biblical precedence for it, and that should be enough reason for us to pray about this, to seek God's face as to exactly how to unite as one with your brothers and sisters. So let's read this prayer again, what we read last week, this part of the prayer. It's verse 20 to 23. Again, this is Jesus' most important prayer. Won't you agree with that? That this is his most vital, his most critical time of prayer. It's before the cross, just the night before the cross, and he's praying concerning the life of his church, his ministry. The entire prayer is about that. The entire prayer is about us. He never prayed for himself. He never prayed that God would somehow uh, take away that cup from him, as we often think in terms of him going to the cross. He never meant take the cross away from him. He meant take the hardship that's going to come upon my, my disciples away. Because the entire night before the cross, this was his emphasis. This was his concern. This was his passion. Not about him going to the cross. This is something he longed for. But what would happen to his disciples? In fact, he said it right there in Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, smite the shepherd and the flock will flee. His concern was the flock, us, Peter, John, James, and the rest. So this is reflected in his prayer. So he was concerned that Peter will be completely taken away. He was concerned that some of his disciples would suffer persecution unto death. And that's exactly why when the Herodians came for him, he reacted defensively, not for himself, but for whom? His disciples. Now keep that in mind. If you would receive this, this would be revelational for you. When they came for Jesus, his concern wasn't himself, as many people believe, take this cup away from me, nevertheless your will. They always say, well, he was trying to get away from the cross. No. I say that's wrong. He was, he was troubled for his disciples. He said it. No one needed to testify concerning man because he knew what was in man. And that reference is connected to the night before the cross. So when the Herodians came for him, he said, who do you come for? Who do you seek? Yeshua of Nazareth. Here am I. And the entire band of the Herodians fell right back. The entire band fell right back. They got back up. He says, who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. Yeshua of Nazareth. He says, here am I. I told you. Here am I. Now, leave these alone. So what was he doing? He was exhibiting his power, what he can do if he wanted. So it wasn't about his own skin on his back, literally. It was about the protection of his disciples. You see? He did this incredible thing right after he prayed this prayer. I do not ask on behalf of these only, but for those also who believe in me, those also who believe in me, through their word, that they will all be one. They will all be echad. Echad would have been the word he would have used in Hebrew. That they will all be echad. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may know that you have sent me. So the world will know that he is sent by God when he and the Father is in us, and we are one. Let me, let me approach that statement from another point of view. 
We cannot be the habitation, the house of, of Yeshua and the Holy One of Israel if we are not one. The unity is a vital factor. Without the unity, we will not be the house of God. We would be a building set apart. Bricks scattered. Living stones meant to live as one together, living separately if we don't have that unity. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. Now that's a tall bar. That's a high standard. The glory that's in him, he has given to us for us. In other words, it's there for us. That we might be one, even as he and God are one. What a high standard for us. That the dimension of echad, oneness and unity, would be the same as with God and himself in us. You know, I mentioned just now the, 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 the aspect of the Star of David, the so-called Mogan David. I've never presented just straightforwardly why we should avoid such a thing. You say, wait a minute, it's on the flag of Israel. It has to be, it has to be about Israel, but it really isn't. The Morgan David became part of, the, of Israel's uh, expression as a nation in the last 200 years only. Just in the last 200 years, the, the Star of David became a part of, of Israel's expression as a, as a nation. It never existed before 200 years ago. In fact, no, I shouldn't say that. The Star of David existed, or what we call the Star of David, has existed for millennia in witchcraft. It's a hexagram. I mean, let's be frank about it. And so I grew up in a Hindu community, and one of the things that I did that I should not have done is I, I peered, I looked into a temple, a little shrine temple uh, at, at, a, at a pundit's house. You know what a pundit is? He's the high priest. He is the shaman of the Hindu religion. So I was at this house, and, and there was a, a, a celebration there, whatever, whatever they call a celebration, a puja. And, and after the puja, I, I, they told me, you should never look into the shrine. The shrine, the curtain was pulled. And what did I do? Well, I looked into it. And what I saw was shocking to me. I saw a swastika, not a crooked swastika, a straight up and down swastika. And I said, what is that doing there? I knew enough to know that this has to do with the Nazis and what happened to the Jewish people. And then next to it, in fact above it, was a hexagram. Then I was really confused because I'm saying that's the Star of David. That has everything to do with Israel. And what is that having to do with a swastika? This is very perplexing to me. It took me a long time to figure it out and it was very simple. Those two symbols are very, very Hindu. And they're very, very ancient. And they carry the same meaning, the same significance. It has to do with, you know what a yin yang is? As it is above, so it is below. Good and evil coexist in equality between good and evil. Well, that's what, the, that's what the Star of David is. That's what the hexagram is. As it is above, so it is below. Two, two triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down. It's witchcraft. And so about two years ago, I got up and I made that statement. Most of the congregation, you've heard me talk about this before, and you just sort of ignored me. Hey, what is he talking about? He's just on a rant about the Star of David. And we made a quick decision to remove them. We didn't, we didn't consult with you. But there was a sense of unity about it. I think most of you said, yeah, you know what? It's true. I've looked it up myself. It is. And there was a sense of unity, and we proceeded in, in removing them, and there wasn't, a, 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 there wasn't a fist fight over it, which is good. Which is good. It, it meant that we saw for ourselves the reality of what the Star of David really represented. By the way, just to end this little discussion about the Star of David, do you know how it got onto the Israeli flag? The Rothschilds. And how did they manage to enforce that happening? Because the rabbis didn't want it. The rabbis knew what it was, and they didn't want it. I'm talking about the rabbis of the turn of the, the last century. When the discussion of a flag came up, the rabbi says, no, we don't want the hexagram on the flag. We want exactly what's in front of us, exactly what's here. This is exactly what they wanted. Right? This is what the rabbis wanted. 
By the way, this is the official flag of Israel. It's in the Knesset. I don't know if you know that. In the Knesset, this is what you got. So the rabbi says, hey, we want the menorah. It's a more fitted symbol for Israel. The Rothschild says, we have the money, and you get the Star of David. Now, who are the Rothschilds? Do you know anything about the Rothschilds? They were the founders of the Illuminati. They and a certain Jesuit by the name of Adam Weishaupt. Now, this is all verifiable through conventional history. Adam Weishaupt, together with the Rothschilds, initiated the Illuminati, and the Illuminati was disbanded 10 years later, but fragmented into 100 fragments, and now controls the world. Let me say this. We have COVID because of the Illuminati. We have COVID because of this effort to bring about a global unity, which was the work of the Illuminati. So the Illuminati gave us, this, gave us the Star of David. That's why we booted it out of here. It's occultic. And when the time came for us to do it, you guys didn't uprise and say, hey, we need to rebel against you here because, because you saw for yourself what I was saying was true and you received it. That's good. I can commend you on that. Right? But we need to be united on every front that's relevant to us as a congregation. We need this unity that we might be one. That oneness is precious and rare. It's, it's valuable to the, to the, to the, to the to the nth degree, it's, it's, it's the most important thing in us. Without it, we don't have this fellowship. Without this, we don't have worship. Without this, we have nothing. We are not a, a uniformed people, okay? Let me say that. We are not a uniformed people. You look around the room, and we're entirely different. Some of us are from Hispanic backgrounds, uh, directly out of Puerto Rico and other Hispanic countries, Spanish countries, I should say. Some of us are Hispanic by, by descent. We're, we're not actually from Spanish-speaking countries, we, we, but we're Spanish in descent. Some of us are American in descent, uh, either white or black. Some of us are, are completely ideologically in a whole different place than many others of us. We're different. We're not a uniformed people. No one says that we should be Uniform. Uniformity is not unity. You follow me? You might be uniform, but completely out of unity. You see how that can work. You look at a, 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 a platoon of Marines. They're pretty uniform, right? Everything about them is almost exact. But the truth is, they may not actually be in unity. <laughs> The, the true un, unifying factor may be completely absent, but they look uniformed. They've been trained together. They've been, pre, they've been prepared together, but they're not in unity at all. Well, I want to say this. We can be entirely different from each other. We don't have to look alike. We don't have to be in the same, in the same demographics. We don't have to be in the same age categories. We can have even different ideologies in some cases, politically and otherwise, but in terms of unity, we must be one. This is the prayer of Yeshua here, that we would be one. In the same dimension as he and the Father is one. Now, I would venture to say that there is no disagreement, no difference between Yeshua and the Father. But is there co-equality or consubstantiation? No, there is no co-equality in that sense, consubstantiation. There is no uniformity, but there is Unity, echadness, oneness. The Bible tells us very early on in, in the book of Genesis that God is one. God is echad. Well, if there were not different components to God, there would be no need for echad. Stands to reason, right? There are components to who God is, and we're talking here about what we call the Trinity, the triune nature of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they're not perfectly uniform in that sense. They are, ek, they are ekhad, they are one. One in orientation, one in purpose. One in objective. And that's the way we should be. That's what God expects from us. One in purpose, one in, one in orientation, one in objective. God expects us to be like that. His son prayed for that unity in us. And I believe it's attainable. It's unattainable when we allow ourselves to get in the way. 
When we allow our natural people, our natural persons, to get in the way, that's when it's not even close to being possible. And we've had many examples uh, over the years of that, this very thing, where people are willing to look united, but truly, inwardly, are absolutely unwilling to be united as one. And there would be a kink in the wheel for a while, but then ultimately it will come down to a decision. Am I going to unite? Am I going to shed the things in me that are prohibiting me from being one with my brothers and sisters? Or am I going to stay my ground and just walk right out of here? Now, why is that such a big deal? Why walking out of here is such a big deal? You know, we're a free country. We live in a free society. I can go worship wherever I want. And you're right. You can pick yourself up and say, I'm going to go to the guys down the road. And I'll say, if you come to me and you say, that's what I'm doing, I'll say, praise God. Someone came to me uh, yesterday and said, I'm going to go off to another church and, 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 and worship. I said, praise God. There's no, there's no hard feelings about that. You're free to go do this. But if you have a sense of appointment to a particular ministry, if this is where you believe God has appointed you, then you are a fitted member of this body of Christ. And in that context, you're not free to leave. You are free to unite. If you're called out, if you have that confession of being called together to stand shoulder and shoulder with your brothers and sisters, you have, you have a mandate to unite so that we can be one. And that's usually God's purpose. Why is it that when someone stumps out of here, it happens after, in many cases, years of struggle, years of strife, and then suddenly there's an eruption and they bolt out of here. I'll tell you why that happens so often, because they're called to be here. It's like, it's like the, the severing of a body member. So think about a human body. Paul used the human body as an analogous picture for unity, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's what he did. Most of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about an analogous picture, an allergy, not an allergy, an allergy. An allegorical picture, most of that chapter is an allegorical picture of the human body being the body of Christ. So let's talk about what we've witnessed here. One member of the body, in an allegorical sense, would have an infection. Why is there an infection? Because they keep pounding a saw. They have a saw and they keep pounding it, they put some salt on it, dip it in vinegar. The saw only gets worse. They're not willing to clean it, come to terms with the fact that there is a sore. They're not willing to stop putting salt on it and dipping it in vinegar. They're content to keep banging the sore. Someone comes along, usually me or one of you, and you say, hey, you've got a sore. You need to stop banging that sore. You need to stop putting salt on your sore. It's not making you any better. And they say, listen, I'm a free person. I'll put salt on my sore if I want it. You say, okay. And the sword just festers and festers and festers until the point where the, the, the member has to be cut off. Who does the cutting off? Me? No. Who does the cutting off? Well, God does the cutting off. I am divine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, I'll abide in you. The Father is divine dresser. Divine in me that does not bear fruit, ah, he will, he will prune it. Not that that person is going to hell, but actually... The reference refers to being thrown into the fire. So it's not so good to be pruned. Okay, so, so the point to all of that is to say this. If you're called to be a member of a congregation anywhere, here, across the road, down the road, you ought to commit yourself to stand together and commit to unity. Are there factors or will there be factors that will push you away from your brothers and sisters? Every day, twice on Sundays. And if I preach five times on a Sunday, you're going to have those factors. What do you do with them? That's the point. Do you yield to your flesh and say, I'm going to, this saw that I have here, which actually isn't a saw, it's something that you yourself did, and you blame it on someone else, I want to stick it in salt. I'm going to pong it. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to play with it. Every time a scar begins to, to form over it, I'm going to rip it off. 
and I'm going to wait for it to get infected. You know, I used to do that as a kid. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but as a kid, I got so many cuts as a kid. I mean, I, I was, again, like I said this morning, I was Johnny West Miller. You know who Johnny West Miller is or was? It's Tarzan. I was Tarzan. And I fell off of mango trees. I would, I would do crazy. I did crazy things. And my body has the scars to, 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 prove, to prove that I did. And at one point in my childhood, it was common for me to walk around with, I hate to say this, with pus dripping from parts of my body. It was common for me as a seven-year-old, ten-year-old, to be, and I, I used to play with it. Rip off the... Rip off the scab and keep that sore, keep that cut going for another six months. I did that. It's fun. You see, sometimes we're like that, that kid. Many sores, and we just take pleasure in the pain that it gives. And we, we, we continue the hurt. Until finally you can't take it anymore and you stomp out of here. I'm going to show them I have a saw and I'm proud of it. It's festering and I am going to show them that I can fester. You, what are you showing? You're not showing me anything. You're showing me that you were unwilling to yield your flesh to God's Holy Spirit. Not to me, not to Larry, not to anyone. You see, the unity factor is so incredibly vital. And the enemy will do everything in his power to drive a wedge between you and your brothers and sisters and to cast you off. Because the last thing the enemy wants is a well-fitted body of Christ here. That's the last thing he wants. That's a nightmare for the devil that there would exist a body of believers that are well-fitted together, each member in its place. No sores, no festering wounds. The devil dreads it. And we ought to give him reason to be afraid. What do you think? How are you going to do this? By committing yourself to unity. Verse 23, chapter 17, John. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them as you have loved me. God loves us. As he loves Yeshua. And when we become that picture of oneness, the world will know that God sent Yeshua. How is that even feasible? How is that even possible? Because they will see him in you. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. By this, all the world will know that you are my disciples, that he himself is seen in us. The world should know that he's here. The world should know that he is in us. They should. By our oneness, by our unity. Now, this directly affects so much of who we are. So much of our, of our ministry is based on this. Let me, let me get a reference here that I, uh, that I want to pull and read for you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Paul understanding the, 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 the critical nature of this and just how important this is. Chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, Paul says, we're there, with all, with, let's, read, let's read 1 to 3. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In other words, conduct yourself in a manner that's worthy of, based on your calling, and not only that, but to the one who called you. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You hear that? Paul is saying a lot. I mean, you can take this and preach on this for days. I mean, literally, you can, you can run with this for a long, long time. I, I love what he, how he concludes that statement in verse 3. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we are, it's incumbent upon us, we are responsible to keep that spirit of unity. Which is the Holy Spirit, right? It is the Holy Spirit that unifies us. That's why the word spirit there is capped. 
he's referring to the Holy Spirit. Preserve the work of the Holy Spirit in us, and we would have this bond, the thing that keeps us united. In other words, what Paul is saying in a, in a, in a different way is that the Holy Spirit in us that we yield ourselves to will keep us bonded as one. You follow me? I'm extracting what Paul said, but that's exactly what he means. That should we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, that will provide for us the bond, the thing that will cause us to be one, the bond of unity. So how important is this bond of unity? It's vital. Without it, we don't have anything. Galatians chapter 6 also. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul here says, and this is, this is pivotal to where I would like to end with this. By the way, in regards to unity and ministry, without unity, without this particular unity that I'm referring to, not uniformity, not superficial oneness, not a big smile and, and, and pat each other on the back, and I'm a Republican, you're a Republican, praise God we're together. <laughs> not that. I'm talking about real spirit unity. I, I hate to keep doing this, but I'm talking about real depth of spirit unity. Without this, we don't have ministry. We don't have ministry here. We don't have ministry in Israel. We have nothing. It is for the sake of our ministry in Israel that we should be united as one. Without that, folks, we don't have it. We, we fall, we've fallen way short. We're not going to be a servant to Israel, folks, if we don't have this essential oneness, echad. Jesus will not be seen in us. Our effectiveness, our effectiveness in Israel is based on Jesus being seen in us. By this, the entire world will know that he is in us, that we are one, we are united in him. How many times have we witnessed that ourselves in Kedumim? I mean, 2050, I, I don't need to rehearse the whole set of events. God did a powerful miracle through you in 2015. He humbled Amalek publicly. Remember what Obama said after that election, right? When the election was, was, was snatched away from Satan's claws, and Bibi Netanyahu and the conservatives on the right won the election in 2015, what was the first thing Obama said on that Monday morning, on that Wednesday morning to follow? What did he say? Dig into the archives. He says, concerning Bibi Netanyahu, he says, you will pay for that. I don't know if you remember those words coming from Obama. He said it to Bibi. You will pay for that. As if Bibi did something. What did Bibi do? He did nothing. He appeared, he appeared at the rally that Daniela Weiss had, had promoted. He appeared, he gave his spiel, and he left. Naftali Bennett is the one who really spoke with power. He's the one that spoke with umph at, at the rally. It was God who stirred within the entire Israeli people. It was God who brought that to bear. Not Bibi Netanyahu, not us, but God used you. He used the oneness in you to allow such a thing, powerful thing, to happen. This will go down in the annals of history, that Amalek was defeated. If a, if, if a block of scripture were to be written today, based on, what is, based on what God is doing in Israel, that event will be a main point. That God, at that time, 2015, humbled Amalek through a group of simple, united believers. The power of unity you see. It's, it's, without it, we have no ministry. Now, in regards to that point, I'm going to go aside here for a moment. I'm going to read in Romans chapter 15. Uh, I, I, sh I should have had this prepared. Romans chapter 15, I'm going to read. Let's, let's read verse 1 and 2. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weakness the weaknesses of those without strength. And not just to please ourselves, you've got to hear that, not just to please ourselves, each of us is to please his neighbor or his brother for his good, to his edification. So this is, this is community living at its, at its height. 
unity to the point where we're not working together, we're not functioning together for ourselves, we're functioning together for the betterment, for the edification of each other. That's the type of unity that Paul expected from the church at Rome that didn't exist, but should exist in us. And then Paul will go on further, and he, let's read five to, five to nine, why not? I feel, I feel like reading this morning. We have all the time in the world. Five to nine. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind one with another according to Messiah Jesus. What is he, what is he talking about? The same mind one with another according to the mind of Messiah Jesus. Have the mind of Messiah Jesus. All of you together have that mind. We know what his mind was. We read it in John chapter 17. That we would be one, even as God and, and himself were one. That was the mind of Messiah Jesus. Have this same mind as Messiah Jesus, is what Paul is saying. So that with one accord, with echad, you know the word accord has its roots in the Hebrew word echad, which is actually, the, the, the root word there is, is another, it's Aramaic. It's like echad. I can't remember what it is right now. But it sounds like echad, accord. So, B, Paul is saying here, in one accord, in one, be echad. So that with one accord in echad, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. That's the unity factor that I've been talking about. Therefore, accept one another, just as Messiah also accepted us to the glory of God. This is the unifying factor. For I say that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. In other words, folks, let me summarize quickly so we can move on. Be one, unite together, purposely commit yourself, lay down your flesh, stop banging that saw, forgive your brothers and sisters, purpose yourself to be one with each other because you are a servant to Israel. And it's not going to happen if you're a divided body. If you have members severed in every direction, you're not going to be that servant to Israel. The only way, I'm paraphrasing in a very broad sense, the only way you can be a servant to Israel, and what, what's, what's, the, what's the project? What's the mission? To confirm to them the, father, the promises given to the fathers. Wow, what an assignment. What an assignment God has given to us. That we, little us, will confirm to Israel God's promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Israel. What a wonderful assignment. You know, quite frankly, you can see that as the talent that God has vested into Fellowship Church. Now ponder that for a moment. Why would I say that this is a talent here? And it may not be a talent at the church down the road because God didn't reveal it to them. Not yet. But he's revealed it to you. And it becomes his investment in you. That you would become a servant to Israel, confirm to them God's promises given to the fathers that's relevant to them. You're not going to have it, Fellowship Church, if you're not one. If you're not united as one body of people. Now I want to carry this further. In Galatians now, chapter 6, verse 2, Paul here speaking, he says, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Mashiach. Bear one another's burden, and therefore fulfill the law of Mashiach, the teaching, the Torah of Mashiach. That's what, he, that's what the word law there is, Torah, which is the teachings, the instructions, right? That's what the word Torah means. So, it goes back to that most important commandment that Jesus gave. Love one another. Be united as one. The unifying factor is the Holy Spirit. But we must yield to the Holy Spirit in order for us to accomplish such a, such a thing. The law of Messiah has to be accomplished by... In, in, in us, by faith, by our commitment to it. When we commit ourselves to the law, the Torah of Mashiach, then... We can fulfill it. 
So what are you talking about? All of a sudden you go from talking about unity, oneness, love, to Torah. They're very connected. I want to tell you this right now. They are indelibly connected. You know, we believe that we're under a new covenant. Right? We're under a new covenant. And for some reason, we believe that under this new covenant, we are not responsible for the law, which is a bizarre thing. Right? There's a statement I saw on Facebook last night. It was a wonderful little statement concerning Torah or responsibility to Torah. You know, a new covenant. The new covenant does not allow us to defile Torah. I made a statement. I have it on my phone. I didn't get to prepare well this morning. Uh, so, so I wanted to just, I wanted to, to make this part of my outline. I didn't. All right. So I was thinking this morning as I was praying the new covenant, if in fact written in our hearts, it's not abolished. How can you abolish the law if it's written on your heart? This is the aspect of the new covenant that I want to, I want to, I want to bear for you right now. Love is an essential part of that new covenant because the fulfillment of the law is ultimately love that's very pertinent to our unity and oneness. It is love in us, inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit, that causes us to be one. But we must commit to it. And that's the obedience factor. That's where Torah comes in. So in other words, we have a new covenant. It doesn't allow us to abolish love, the fulfillment of the law. Many Christians say, I'm not under the old covenant. I'm under the new covenant. So I'm not responsible for the law or the fulfillment of the law. If you're not responsible for the law, you're not responsible for the fulfillment of the law, which is love, which is to obey the commandments of Jesus. How can you have the new covenant at work in you and break Jesus' commandment? Jesus said it. The one who loves me, it is he that keeps my commandment. And he said it again. If you love me, keep my commandments. So there's a new covenant that are at work in us. I will give that, I'll give them that. It's absolutely true. But that new covenant is supposed to, 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 to work inwardly in us. If the law is written on my heart in this new covenant, then from my heart will come obedience to God, and I will work towards the fulfillment of the law, which is to love each other. It's, it's simple. Which is the greatest commandment? Yeshua? Ah. The greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. To love. Okay, and that, that Pharisee walked away and said, that's a good word, I like that. The church comes along and says, the law is abolished. <laughs> you know, let's, let's look at the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, the new covenant here is related to Israel. What Israel will ultimately receive, a new covenant that will transform the people of Israel. We Christians, we believe that we have already received that new covenant. And to an extent, it's true. And I will explain to you to what extent. It is true that I have been, a, 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 I've received, I've received that new covenant on the inner man, because I received the Holy Spirit. God put his law on my heart when he filled me with his Holy Spirit. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a recipient of that new covenant. I don't replace Israel. That's where we get tangled up in foolishness. I don't replace Israel because I've experienced that new covenant. I've received it. I am a picture of what God will ultimately do with Israel, in fact, do with all humanity. God's going to strike his covenant with all humanity uh, when heaven comes to earth, the new creation. So the, what, I, what, what I'm going to read here in chapter 31, 31 to 34 is relevant to Israel, but it's relevant to us as well because we have already received that new covenant. As we were filled with the Holy Spirit, God wrote his law on our hearts. Let's read it. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel 
and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. See that? He will put his law within them, on their hearts. And on their hearts I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not be his people, and he will not be their God fully until that law is written on their hearts, which has a lot to do with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All of Israel will have a Holy Spirit experience. Ezekiel chapter 38 is very vivid. God said it. They will be my people. I will be their God when I put my spirit within them. So, for God putting his spirit within Israel, it is very much the same as God putting his law on their hearts. Just different terminology. Right? It's synonymous. How can you not see this? Ezekiel says in Ezekiel chapter 36 that they will be his people, I will be their God when I put my spirit within them. Jeremiah chapter 31, they will be my people, I will be their God when I put my law on their hearts. Synonymous, same experience. So when you had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is exactly what has happened. God has put his law, his teaching, his will on your heart. How can you have the heart of God without love? How can you have the teaching of God, the Torah of God on your heart without the fulfillment of Torah, which is love? And if you love each other, you will unite as one. In fact, love is the only, the only factor that will unite us. The Holy Spirit does the work. There's no question about that. But the Holy Spirit brings us to a place where we can love one another and not see each other in the most negative of lights. We all have spiritual bondage. Don't shake your head at me. We all have dimensions of spiritual bondage. Things that trouble us. Most, most, most of the times it's from our past. Our life's mission is to discover those areas of spiritual bondage and, 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 and trouble issues and lay them down before God. Surrender them to God. Die to these bondages that holds us back. One of, the, one of the most common spiritual bondages that we experience is a sense of rebellion against authority. If, someone's an, if someone is an authoritative figure, immediately, well, I don't have to listen to her, I don't have to listen to him. That's our spiritual knee-jerk reaction in many, many cases. And it's an infection. It can become one of those sores that you keep banging, banging, banging. So if you have such a thing working in you, what do you do? Now, we all don't. Not all of us do, but some of us do. We still struggle with that issue. The pastor gets up and says something about COVID. I don't want to hear this. I'm not going to listen to what he says. You know how many times I stand here and preach and present and you can't even look at me? You can't even face me? When I see this, and this, and this, I know there's an infection. And you are just banging away at it. <laughs> That's the evidence. You can't face me. You're in your Bible. Or you're on your phone. Most times, it's a problem with authority. I've said something that that presented myself in the light of being an authoritative figure, and I'm not having that. I've had enough of that in my life. Right? Well, that's a problem. <laughs> because unfortunately, in my position here, in the position of leadership here, there are times when I'm going to have to put my foot down and say, this is what we're doing. Now, that, that can be an, an impediment for you, Instead of allowing it to become an impediment, come and talk to me. Come and interface with me. And you would find that that spirit that rose up in you was very much just that, a spirit. And you got to tie to it. 
And why do, why do you have to die to it? For the sake of the law that's written on your heart. For the sake of the Torah that's been put in you, you die to it. I've had to do it many, many times. Do you know how many offenses I've suffered here at Fellowship Church? Do you know how many? I don't think you do. It's impossible for you to know how many offenses I've suffered. I'm not, I'm not proud of the fact that I've experienced many, many offenses. But with every offense, it's imperative for me to pick myself up and walk on and forgive and move on. For the sake of Messiah, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the ministry in Israel, I must, it's imperative, and praise God, by and large, I've been able to do it. Once, I, I didn't do it very well, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say I was pushed to the limit, but I was. Uh, but I shouldn't have a limit. I should not have a limit. I should be limitless when it comes to the love of God. God has put his law on my heart. I should be able to carry my brother to the nth degree. You know the, the old song, he and heavy, he is my brother. Well, I should be able to carry my brother, regardless of the offenses, as far as I can. As far as God would allow me to. And God would allow me to carry him 70 times 7. Not 7 times. 70 times 7, for the sake of the law that he has put within my heart and for the sake of the ministry that he expects, the, the fruit that he expects to bear in me. It's a talent, folks. I hate to, I hate to put it on you like that. What happened to the, to, the, to the servant who wasn't faithful with his talent? Not so good. What happened to the servants who were faithful with their talents? Come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what they got. So for us, it's a talent, individually, also as a congregation, that we would unite before God as one. So pray about this this week. What can I do to be one with my brothers and sisters? We're not able to hold hands. We're not able to hug each other. We're not able to even do communion at this point. So we feel like we're separated. We feel like we're divided. What can we do? Pray about it this week. And ask yourself, what can I do to ensure that the law that's written on my heart is not being squandered by my flesh? What can I do? So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for what you will do in Nelly and in Lisa, Lord. I, we again, Lord, bring Lisa before you. We pray for healing, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Micah here safely. God, we pray that you would complete the work that you've began in Micah. And Lord, as a congregation, help us, O oh God, to better serve you in that place of oneness and unity. Let us be one before you, we pray. This is our desire, Lord, that your prayer, Yeshua, would be fulfilled in us, in this place. And we bless you and we praise you, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to unite so that we can be that voice in the midst of your people, Israel. And honor you and serve you, Lord. We thank you, Father God. Amen.